I want to introduce the concept of modern portfolio theory. Now this was first introduced by Harry Markowitz in 1952 and he would later win the Nobel Prize in 1990 for this contribution. Uh, what it does is it shows mathematically how to create a portfolio with the optimal risk and return characteristics. So prior to this, the rule of investing was to diversify by not putting all your eggs in one basket. Uh, but there really was no discussion of the quantity and the composition of the securities in the portfolio. What Markowitz did was he looked at the mean and variance of the portfolio. Now in terms of the expected return of the portfolio, it's simply a weighted average of the expected returns of the securities in the portfolio. Now unfortunately, you can't just average the variance for each security in order to get the portfolio variance. And the reason you can't do that is that securities may move in, in different directions, or at least they don't move in lockstep with one another. So one may go up and the other may go down, and it turns out, in depending on the case, if they happen to move in opposite directions all the time, that is, they are perfectly negatively correlated, you could take two risky securities and combine them and actually have a portfolio that has no risk. So what you need to look at is the covariance or the correlation between pairs of securities. So let me show you what, a, what the variance for a portfolio for a two-stock portfolio would look like. So you have two securities, A and B. It would be the weight in A squared times the variance of A plus the weight in B squared times the variance of B plus two times the weight in A times the weight in B times the covariance between A and B. That's how you get the portfolio variance. So this part here really measures the riskiness of the individual securities. This part measures the diversification part. Now it turns out that as you add securities to the portfolio, the number of covariance terms will increase faster than the number of variance terms. Uh, the number of different covariance terms is actually equal to n squared minus n divided by 2. So if you added a third security here, c, you'd have these terms plus wc squared times the variance of c, but then you'd have terms like this between a and b, between A and C, and between B and C. So you added one more security, but you added two more covariance terms. So it looks something like this. Here are the number of securities, which would be the number of variance terms. If you have two securities, you're going to have one covariance, uh, one different covariance. There's one between A and B and, and one between B and A, but they're the same. If you have three securities, now you have three covariance terms. Four securities, you have six. If you went up to 10 securities, you'd have 45 covariance terms using this formula. 10 squared minus 10 gives you 90 divided by 2. If you have 100 securities in your portfolio, you'd have 4,950 covariance terms. Because you can see that covariance starts to become a lot more important than variance. Now, here's a graph that shows you as you increase the number of securities in the portfolio, you actually start to reduce risk. And we break it up this way. There's a non-diversifiable part, which would have to do with the average covariance between the pairs of securities. But this part, you can decrease by diversifying. That is, you know, if you have several stocks in your portfolio if one doesn't do very well the other may do the others may do better and offset some of that loss okay but you can't get rid of all of the risk now using these concepts we can plot out the return expected return and risk characteristics for portfolio so down here we have on the x axis the standard deviation or the total risk of the portfolio. Here we have the expected return of the portfolio. And I've plotted a few points here, portfolio A, portfolio B, portfolio C. 
A is better than B because for the same level of risk, and I tried to draw it that way, A has a higher expected return. Return is good, risk is bad. A is also better than C because for the same level of expected return, A has a lower level of risk. Now, you can't say clearly which is better between B and C because B has a lower expected return but also has less risk than C. But using this concept, sometimes we refer to it as dominance, A dominates B, A dominates C, we can eliminate portfolios and look for the ones with the highest expected return for a given level of risk or the lowest risk for a given level of expected return. And if we do that, we get what's referred to as the efficient frontier. So again, here are a bunch of different portfolios. A, B, and C lie on what we call the efficient frontier. That is, they have the highest expected return for a given level of risk or the lowest risk for a given expected return. I also put some other points in here. D, D is not as good because for the same level of risk, you could have a higher expected return up at B. For the same level of um, expected return, you could have a lower, lower level of risk. I didn't draw a point here, but you could move this way and have less risk. Okay, likewise with E. Now F is great, okay, has a higher expected return and a lower level of risk than let's say B, but it doesn't exist, so you can't, you can't buy it just not there. I mean, you would love to have this portfolio, but it doesn't exist. So how do we decide which portfolio investors will choose? Well, we can draw in indifference curves. Okay, you may recall indifference curves from economics. They show the trade-off between two things. Uh, they give you the same level of satisfaction. Now, normally they are shaped this way going from the northwest down to the um, southeast because both goods are desirable. Here we have something that's not desirable, risk, and something that is expected return. So they have a different shape. And depending on where they touch the efficient frontier dictates um, which portfolio you'll choose. You want to be on the highest indifference curve right, the greatest level of satisfaction, that would mean moving to the northwest. To the northwest means higher return, higher expected return, and lower risk. So that would be right here. Now the problem with this concept is, depending on different risk preferences, people will choose different portfolios. So let's move on and add the concept of a risk-free asset. When you have a risk-free asset, we know that the combination of the risk-free asset and the risky portfolio will give us a straight line relationship between return and risk space, return and standard deviation. So between R, F, and A, and we want to choose points on the efficient frontier because those are the most efficient portfolios. So R, F, and A, this would be the trade-off, the straight line between the risk-free rate and portfolio B would be here. And you would get, I did the equation for this line here, which would be the risk-free rate, the intercept term, plus the amount of risk you choose divided by, um, or times, the expected return of B minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation of B. This is the slope of this line here, okay? A would have a slope, but we would substitute in um, the expected return of A and the standard deviation of A here. And you can see that B is better, right? It's a steeper slope. It's a greater trade-off. Um, it's a greater excess return per unit of risk. Okay, We re actually refer to this as the sharp ratio, this, this equation here. You want the steepest slope you can get. It turns out that C would be the best in this example because it's just tangent to this efficient frontier. But again, unless everybody sort of sees the efficient frontier the same, we're not going to get the same solution. So 
What we do in finance is we assume that investors have the same expectations. Therefore, they face the same efficient frontier, and therefore they will all choose this same portfolio, and we call this portfolio Portfolio M, or the market portfolio. And this line here is what we refer to as the capital market line. Now, if everybody's buying the same portfolio M, how do you change the amount of risk that you're taking? Everybody has different preferences, right? Some people like risk, some people don't. You can do that by changing the combination of the risk-free asset, which would be some sort of treasury securities, and this risky portfolio M, which represents all risky assets held in their market value proportions. So someone who is uh, fairly conservative would buy some treasury securities and some of this risky portfolio, maybe 50-50, and they might be about here. On the other hand, someone who is a more aggressive investor would borrow at the risk-free rate to buy more of Portfolio M, and they would be out here somewhere. So what are the implications of this modern portfolio theory of um, Harry Markowitz? First, portfolios should be evaluated on their mean and variance. It turns out if all investors have the same expectations, then there's one optimal portfolio, the market portfolio, that consists of all risky assets held in their market value proportions. Um, investors should buy a total market index fund because this represents the optimal portfolio. Investors can adjust the risk by changing the percentage of the risk-free asset and the market portfolio that they hold. More conservative investors will lend by buying treasury securities more aggressive investors will borrow at the risk-free rate to buy more of the market portfolio. And some of the extensions of this part of modern portfolio theory is that it turns out that calculating the optimal portfolio was nearly impossible um, computationally in the 50s and 60s because computers were not that powerful and there were a lot of inputs. There's a lot of covariance terms, right? 4,950 in a 100 stock portfolio. It turns out Sharp in 1963 introduces something referred to as the single index model, which greatly reduces the number of inputs. What it does is it assumes that those covariances or correlations can be calculated through the market index. And I have um, a video on that, and I'll provide the link below. Also, the capital asset pricing model, which prices securities based on their non-diversifiable or systematic risk, as measured by beta, is also an extension. and was done by Sharp in 64, Lintner in 65, and Mosin in 1966. So I also have one on that um, as well that I'll post below. So I hope this gives you an idea of the concept of modern portfolio theory.